I was just praying uh, and meditating before this gathering and um, I just had uh, a thought come to me from the Beyond All Idols section of A Course in Miracles. It's, it's a line that's been very, very helpful to me over the years and it's, it's, really, it's really helped me out when it seems like in this world I had an experience where I didn't get something that I wanted and then I turned inside for help and popped the book open or whatever. And, and what the line says is, when you decide upon the form of what you want, you lose the understanding of its purpose. It's very profound when you think about it. I mean, it's like that one thread could unravel the entire perceptual illusion if you just let it kind of wind and weave you know, in your mind. Because really when we look at life, I think the underlying assumption for human beings is you're here on planet Earth, you have wants, you have desires, it's okay to get while the getting's good. Uh, some people would even say whoever, you know, gets the most toys and wins when you die and all that stuff like that. But actually for others it's still, it's still very much embedded in the human condition to want. Uh, I was actually named after King David uh, from the Psalms. Some of you might remember in the Bible there was the Psalms. I think you might remember one of those verses that's quite famous, the 23rd Psalm. Uh, and the, it's interesting if you just, if you don't even remember the whole thing, the first line might, you know, stick with you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, it's an interesting way to start a psalm, a song. And then we look at this line from the Course, when you decide upon the form of what you want, you lose the understanding of its purpose. And you can start to put those together, uh, where you can start to see that happiness doesn't come from wanting. Uh, actually, wanting and desiring comes from lack. If healing can be instantaneous, if, if uh, you can have happiness in a moment, and that's really what the teachings are, it's just a decision, then when you want something, it, it presupposes that you're lacking. And uh, one time when I was just meditating on uh, the Kingdom of Heaven and Nirvana, I got this word that came into mind, it was called desirelessness. I like the way it was rolled off my tongue, des desirelessness. Uh, it's the same thing. So, we can say in the state of perfect oneness there are no wants or desires because it's perfect fulfillment. Everything is perfectly fulfilled. Perfect contentment. Perfect completion. Uh, I think it was Susan today, this morning, during the morning session, she was, you know, she was saying, is there like a, a succinct definition you can give for the atonement? And I said, yeah total escape from the past and a complete lack of interest in the future. Uh, that's what the atonement is. That's the correction in our mind for returning to eternal oneness. It's a beautiful little succinct definition from Jesus. So we can say in a state of fulfillment there's no wants, there's no desires, there's nothing, there's no thought of could there be more. That the ego is the belief and, and and could there be more? Imagine if, if everything was just everything, and you knew yourself as everything, without end or limit, just unending eternal love, that the idea of more is, it would be laughable. And in the Course we, we are learning that it is laughable, but it's not laughable if you believe in the concept of more. You know, it, it's, it actually is quite, um, confining, because then you for, are forever seeking more. And in that same section in the Course it says, what is an idol do you think you know? An idol is for more of something, it does not matter what. You know, the, it starts to come clearer and clearer that the, the human condition is a predicament that's really an impossible, it's an impossible state of mind in which there seems to be lack and a desire for more to fill that lack.
that, and it, it's like it never ends. It's like you just search and search and seek and seek, and you never find. You know, looking for love in all the wrong faces, looking for love in too many places. All the, the country songs had it right too, you know. It's still seeking and not finding, and if you follow the ego's belief system, which sponsors lack, which sponsors a scarcity, then you will forever be seeking and not finding. Very frustrating. Almost like banging your head against a brick wall. Uh, after a while, it gets really frustrating because the bricks are not giving into the skull. <laughs> and it's just not going to happen. And you can continue if you, if you would like, but it's, it's very, very, very frustrating. So, when we forgive, which is the purpose that we've been given by the Holy Spirit, we have to live intuitively and follow our inner guidance and learn to live a new way instead of seeking after things, seeking after objects, seeking to possess, seeking to own, seeking to capture. We have to realize that that mode is ego-seeking. And we can't know ourselves as wholeness or purity or love while we're still in the seeking mode. It's just another trick to believe that you can be a fulfilled seeker. Mm -hmm. And even when I hear the term spiritual seeker, sometimes I think, why not be a spiritual finder? I think spiritual finder uh, sounds much more wonderful to me, like realization, than, than seeking. You know, because we're so used to ter using that term, spiritual seekers. It's just like another category of, oh, there's all these human beings, and there's just a slice of the human beings that are spiritual seekers. When we were talking, Jennifer was talking, or I think it was yesterday, just saying, well, everybody, or no, breakfast, everybody is seeking, but everyone just seems to be at different levels of awareness of the seeking. Everybody's truly wanting to have an experience of love, but some aren't conscious of, of it as an identity that, that they've displaced. Some think it's actually to be found in, you know, dating columns or online dating or in uh, thrill-seeking or adventure-seeking. And there's many ways to seek in this world. And we're really learning that the premise underneath has to be questioned before we can relax and accept and have a, a true sense of fulfillment. So, I would say that what the Course in Miracles has done for me is it's, it's saying while you believe you're here in this world, uh, you will search. Uh, you're on a search mission because you don't know who you are and you're in search mode. And so it's just saying why not turn your searching inside your mind instead of looking out among all the images of the world. If you're searching for peace, happiness, joy, it's still search mode. And if you still want, which, you know, we have to start where we believe we are. So if you say, okay, I'm, I'm not quite ready for that first line of uh, the Psalm 23. I, I shall not want. I'm not quite ready. I, that's, that's a spiritual bypass, Jesus. I'm not, I'm not really ready for that. Then he says, that's okay. But while you believe you want, he gives us another set of ideas. He says, The peace of God is my one goal, the aim of all my living here, the end I seek, my purpose and my function and my life while I abide where I am not at home. You see how he's taking the want word, the peace of God, and he's turning it into my one goal. It's what I want. And that is something that, even that is very unnatural, because none of us are used to peace, peace of mind goals, you know, nobody, you know, eat your carrots and your peas and, you know, you'll get some peace of mind. You know, no, it's like, then you can go out and play, or then you can have dessert. But we were never held off a reward. If we get good grades in school, then we'll have peace of mind. The parents were never, never had the audacity to to even dangle that carrot for us, because why? Because they didn't have it. <laughs> and they weren't going to ask their children to go for something that maybe they had not found themselves, because that would be hypocrisy. But now we're actually to the point where we can start to say, 
we can take peace, peace of mind, and make it a priority in our life. The reason I'm going to Hawaii is, okay, it's for peace of mind. Or the reason I'm going to read this book, the reason I'm going to practice uh, Tai Chi, or that I'm going to, whatever, join the bowling team, or go golfing, or whatever. It doesn't really matter what things you enjoy, what things you believe in, but if you start to put that purpose of peace, when you go to the gym, when you go to restaurants, when you go to Chautauquas, you know, it's even possible to go to a Chautauqua and try to get some knowledge, you know, and you can go back and stuff a few more notches on the belt. Yeah, I, I heard a few good lines there. I'm going to remember those for my book, you know, or something. Even if you're going to a Chautauqua to try to get something, come away with something that you think you didn't have in the first place, it's really not not the purpose. You want to come with that desire for peace. Like, I just want to experience peace of mind at the Chautauqua like I would in the grocery store or the market or down by the beach or anything. We want to start to transfer that, that goal and really accept it as, as a possible present moment experience. That we actually can experience a present goal, present moment goal instead of forever trying to look out for something in the future, believing that we'll be happy when we attain something. And I hear a lot of people do that with enlightenment and spiritual salvation, is they put it in the future, and that gets really frustrating too, you know, trying to attain something where it's always off in this hypothetical future, when none of us really know if there will be one, or if there ever was one. Seems like a risk to the ego. Uh, what am I committing to? It's, in, it's a May order. <laughs> <laughs>